despite it. Uh, listen, Young Chopsky, I need you to do something. I know I'm telling you this is the intro to the episode, but the way this works is I record something and then we edit it and then release it. So this isn't an impossible ask. But what I need you to do is at some point, doesn't have to be this point, but at some point, we, we are going to need a song for the Spider Network. Or like a sound cue. Yeah, some kind of like, you know, I saw a spider just uh, yesterday climbing over on my couch, hurtling toward me, and I thought about the spider network. That is the one way, fellas, if you ever are getting chased by a woman, just what I do is I keep a pocket of spiders. One pocket no. of my dungarees <laughs> has spiders, and I throw them out behind me like a ninja throws caltrops. And, uh, and that's, caltrops are like a smoke store, a thing you buy at smoke stores for, to fight against pursuers. And, and it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll stop a, basically cripple a city's economy. I screamed so loud. I'm not going to lie. So loud when I saw it. Darted across the room. Started crying. I can't handle spiders. It's why I hate uh, fascists so much, which we're <laughs> going to get into in this episode. Do you know what I do whenever, uh, whenever, whenever girlfriends have asked me to take care of a spider problem for them? What? I take the spider, pretend that I killed it, and then I let it go. Oh, that's nice. You should. You should just say, goodbye, buddy. Go outside now. I let it go in their purse. Welcome to True Anon. <laughs> we haven't done a, one of those in a while. That's nice. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. One of what? Uh, where we do the funny voice, where we go like, True Anon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, let's, let's bust one of those out in here. <laughs> I'm so excited for this episode today. You're always excited. By the way, I'm Liz. I, my name is Brace, and we are joined, of course, by the producer, Young Chomsky. Not our producer, Young Chomsky, the producer, Young Chomsky. It's a different one. We, mm. we have replaced him. It's like a, he's like a, a European house DJ. <laughs> we are getting into some... So, yeah, Bra- so Brace said this is his favorite stuff, and it's true, because we're talking Nazis. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. We're talking Spe- more Nazis. And specifically... Well, specifically, a certain little village down in uh, the Bavarian part of Chile. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and this is, of course, part three of our... This is part three, right? I, I don't fucking know. I think well, this is This part is three. unofficial, so I who don't know. knows? Yeah, yeah, true. Of our unofficial, unauthorized, and totally illegal subseries. The Spider Network. <laughs> yeah, you're, we're talking your favorite thing. We're, we're talking esoteric Nazism. We're talking my favorite thing. Latin America. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's just get into it. Welcome to episode three. I'm kind of sound like I'm doing ASMR here. <laughs> Welcome to episode three of our Spider Network subseries. Today we have with us, deep from his bunker, somewhere in the Midwest, I can't remember which state, we have Michael S. Judge from the Death is Around the Corner podcast and uh, a notorious freak. Michael, how you doing? <laughs> La Aranya Internacional. I will say, I, ca- no, I, I want to take that out. Calling you notorious freak sounds dark. You're just a regular freak. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a regular freak. See, I'm here, I'm here for a dialectical synthesis because on every other podcast, uh, people in the comments go like, oh, you guys are so bad at pronunciation. You guys are even worse than Felix, which is like the low bar. And on my podcast, they go like, oh, you're tryhard who says everything right. So oh, I'm going to say everything of right. Oppor- yeah. You'll have plenty of opportunity. With <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we'll synthesize uh, me saying everything completely strange, apparently. <laughs> Brace not knowing what language is what, and you yeah. saying everything perfect. Yeah, I'm about one to thing jump I will on say, Spanish. I was about <laughs> to say, like, I, I didn't know that these were, so I was like reading this Colonia Dignidad stuff, not to, a little spoiler alert there, and I was like, whoa, German and Spanish are separate? I thought the <laughs> oh, whole yeah. thing was just like the European <laughs> thing. 
<laughs> like all those languages were just kind of the same language, different dialects, but well, they understand each other, I think. You learn something new. I think so, if you're involved with the Nazis, you can just talk to other Nazis. <laughs> yeah, it's like a mind meld sort of situation. Yeah. So, uh, is this our third episode about the Spider Network, Liz? I, I think so. That's what we're calling it, by the way, in case uh, people listening or new listeners don't know. Uh, what we're talking about. Do you want to explain a little bit what we call the Spider Network? Yes, and then I'll probably have Michael jump in and talk a little bit about it too. But uh, what I, yeah, what we call the Spider Network is uh, the actual post-war order that, mm. by the way, morphed into what we have today. This, this, everything we're talking about today did not exist in a vacuum. It was not a discrete event unconnected from any others. What happened in the past is directly... Uh, uh, precedented what is happening today. It's all the same world. And that, right. that gets a little difficult to think about with this kind of stuff because you're like, oh man, Nazis, South America, the CIA, blah, blah, blah. But like, no, we are living, we aren't even living in this world shadow. We are living in this world. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how I think of it. I mean, that I was very unspecific, but, but uh, basically it is the, is the network of um, ex-Nazis, Christ, how to explain this? <laughs> so when America defeated <laughs> Germany or helped defeat Germany, uh, instead of smashing Nazism, it absorbed it. And then mm. America's sort of uh, process of globalizing this merged ideology of, of fascism and, uh, and capitalism and, um, and it became this kind of globe-encompassing shadow state. And that is, uh, that is what the series is about. Yeah, that's what we like to call the Spider Network. Yeah, I just actually just read the other day um, that between 1949 and 1970, the German Ministry of the Interior never had less than 50% uh, Nazi Party members in its yep. leadership positions. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I mean, when I talk about absorbing, I mean literally absorbing. A lot of yeah. the people that come up in this, this episode uh, were, were either members of the Nazi party, members of, of parties that were modeled after the Nazis, and quite a lot of them worked with Western intelligence agencies, specifically the, the CIA, but also just like literally um, officials from, from Western governments uh, that, that, that had no problem interacting with them and using their services. Absolutely. And I think if, if I could sort of be a little tangential here, that sure. um, one, one good way to look at it, one good heuristic uh, it, to make sense of all the stuff we're about to talk about is the official post-World War II narrative versus the actual one. And the official one, the kind of Francis Fukuyama story, is that you know, on VE Day, every Nazi and fascist mysteriously disappeared. They all just vaporized. Uh, except the ones who went to the Nuremberg trials and justice was done. And then for the next, you know, 40 odd years, it was uh, a conflict between liberal capitalist democracy, you know, evil Soviet authoritarian communism. And we won because essentially God was on our side. And from that point on, there is nothing left to history but the inevitable spread of liberal capitalist democracy. One of my favorite things about that asshole Fukuyama is that three weeks after September 11th, he wrote a public letter saying, uh, hey, you know, real tragedy. Uh, sorry for the families, but I'm still right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not wrong. Uh, this is, this, everything is still going to happen the way I said it would. So that's kind of the official story. And I think the real story since World War II is about what you could call shadow states or paranational entities that usually begin with some kind of national affiliation and then detach mm. and, and become their, essentially their own governments. And for someone in the United States, the CIA would be the most obvious and the most accessible because the CIA, you know, we're taught to think of it the same way we think of uh, the Department of the Interior for example, you know, that it's just another government agency that just performs a role. And that's not true at all. That since Alan Dulles took over the CIA in 1953, it has essentially become a shadow government. It has become a, uh, an organization with its own motives, its own means toward achieving those motives, 
Uh, they may or may not reconcile with you know, you know the motives of the rest of the executive branch or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the best point of comparison for the CIA would be the SS. Mm. It, it, it's a really similar organization in that the SS began as you know just a, a security service for the yep. highest members of the Nazi Party, and it eventually came to set up sort of mirror uh, organizations for every single facet of the German government until it was a separate government virtually unto itself. And it was the one that Hitler trusted and relied upon much more than the actual German government because... Oh, yeah, even even the army. I mean, his, oh, his relationships with the Wehrmacht deteriorated from basically day two. And, yeah. and he really did only rely on the SS for basically everything, for foreign policy, uh, which way superseded the, the regular foreign office of the, of the Germany. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any, any, anytime there was something important, the Waffen SS were the people he wanted to deal with mm-hmm. because fanatical devotion to the Nazi party and to Nazi ideology was baked in at the ground level. Whereas, you know, the, the normal German government was still full of people who were just bureaucrats. And when Nazism came along, they kind of went, eh, you know, whatever. Um, and the, the CIA would be the most obvious of these organizations to an American, especially an American who, I mean, I'm guessing anyone listening to this show will know about all kinds of things they've done in Central and South America and Africa and Southeast Asia and so on. But organizations like this exist all over the world from mm-hmm. uh, Le Cercle, the, mm-hmm. the group you guys have talked about, the reactionary Catholic group that... Um, you know, takes in people from all over Western and Southern Europe in particular. Uh, I didn't know this until recently, but the people who ran Margaret Thatcher's campaign in Britain were Le Cercle. Yep. Uh, yeah, they were a group called S.H.I.E.L.D. that were uh, basically a detachment of Le Cercle. And P2, the right. propaganda de Douai Lodge in Italy that you've talked about, which was kind of a an omnibus collection of all kinds of neo-fascist currents in Italy. Yeah. I, I and 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 I think really notably in the disguise. Well, I don't know if you even want to call it the disguise of a Masonic lodge. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think almost anyone outside of Italy understands how insane it is that Silvio Berlusconi ran that country for almost twenty years. Can you explain uh, why people wouldn't understand that? Well, the P two Lodge was. I mean, there had been neo fascist currents. Uh, literally since the moment the fascism officially ended in Italy, yeah. you know, since since the uh, mid '40s, and various fascist organizations like the uh, Agente Press, for example, that was mm-hmm. part French and part Portuguese and part Italian, and the groups founded by people like uh, Stefano Della Chiaie, yeah, who and, will be coming uh, up to in today's episode, by the way. Yeah, and Guido Giannettini and, mm-hmm. and a million other people uh, sort of coalesced into the P2 Lodge, which ran all kinds of operations from neo-fascist terrorism uh, during what are called in Italy the Anni di Piombo, the Years of Lead, mm-hmm. uh, during which the official story is that extremist left and right groups uh, groups like P2 on the right, and then groups like the Brigadi Rossi, the uh, the Red Brigades on the left, were you know attacking each other and so forth. But the further we get away from it historically, the more it looks like the right wing groups may have done almost all the actual terrorism and yeah. assassinations, and then blamed it on the left mm. as as something part of something called the strategy of tension, which I'm I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, and so there there was the Outright street terrorism, assassination of politicians. There was train also station bombing. Train station bombing, yeah. But there was also heavy media ownership and media involvement and coverage of these events. They were in control not only of the events themselves, but of how they got covered in the Italian press. Uh, there was deep involvement with the banking sector, yeah. and it, in particular, the Vatican Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people, when they hear P2, the thing they probably think of first is... Roberto Calvi and uh, the Banco Ambrosiano. Yep. And P2 was laundering money for the CIA. P2 was laundering uh, mafia money. I personally, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but um, uh, I think there's an excellent chance that P2 was involved in the Marc Dutroux 
mm. uh, aff- affair in Belgium. And for listeners who may not have heard of that, Dutroux was a guy who um, kidnapped a lot of children who ended up raped and murdered. And when he was arrested for it, said he had been doing it for various right-wing elements within the Belgian government and Belgian high society. And one of the elements he named was uh, P7. And P7 was another Masonic lodge in Belgium, which existed as a front to filter money to P2. People who didn't want it to be known that they were giving money to P2 sent it through P7. So the, the combination of Dutroux's involvement with P7 and the fact that various P2-involved people have been caught up in sex trafficking and child kidnapping scandals since yep. then. Um, not a lot of people know. I, I was raised very Catholic, so I kind of have an eye on the church mm. all, at all times. And um, the election of this last pope, Pope Francis, the one all the liberals like, uh, he wasn't supposed to be the pope. No, no, he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, the only reason he's the pope is that the guy they wanted got caught in a, a mafia-connected sex trafficking scandal yeah. right before the papal election. And Pope Francis, or uh, Jorge Maria Bergoglio, his you know, pre-papal name, he's got one long. Uh, so they thought, we'll let this guy be pope for like nine months and then he'll die. And then we'll elect the guy we actually wanted. Yeah, that was a and, whoops. <laughs> yeah, and he just keeps yeah. living and living. So... <laughs> The fact that Silvio Berlusconi, a guy who is you know, up to his neck in all this, you can literally go online and see his membership card in yeah. the Propaganda Due Lodge. It's, it's insane that he was ever the president. It's, it's, it's as if the, um, the presidency of the United States were held for 20 years by like a joint presidency of Donald Trump and like Otto Scorzani. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's yes. fucking nuts. Or it's like if, you know, HW was somehow more cartoonish and garish. Yeah. Because he himself, you know, like, I still think it's totally insane that we had director of the CIA become the president. That, oh, like, absolutely. should never, it, that was like a crossover event that should have never happened. Yeah, it you should know be what illegal. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. shouldn't be allowed I mean, to run for president. The way that, I love the way that you started this by saying that these, um, the way to think of these, you know, organizations, and again, we're going to get more into this, is as detachments, that they eventually detach from, kind of from their host. They're like parasites in this way, yes. right? But they attach and become like something they weren't intended to be. And, you know, HW kind of like crossing over from you know, what people colloquially call the deep state, shadow government, however you want to call that. I Sometimes I find that, like, maybe those aren't even the best ways to put it because it sounds like it's something that undergirds everything as right. opposed to this sort of, like, as you say, detached, extraneous, um, like, nebulous. I, I, I think of it as lattice work. Mm. Like, like yeah, or, yes. or, or like, you know, when you, when you see commercials for like Verizon or one of these companies and they'll show they have cell towers all over the world and the shell, they, they have connections between the cell yeah, towers. It's every maps. country, every place. <laughs> exactly. Those maps. This is how this works too. Like yes. any one of those things that you mentioned or any of the one of the things that we'll talk about today too connects to basically every single other one. And whenever you say yes. something like that. Whenever you are like very sure of yourself and tell people, no, these things connect, people automatically think that you're like crazy or something, that, that you have one of these, you know, boards with the pins and the yarn going from here to there. But like this is in black and white, all existed and all exists. Right. Like this yeah, isn't we, something that we're, this is no conjecture. This isn't like something we're making up. This is all reported, happened. Many, many people died and- and it faded further, sort of, it, it more merged. I think that one of the things that changed is that that world and sort of our world became pretty much the same world. And right, that's yes. kind of what we're living in now. We're living, mm. it's like they created like, you know, through that lattice work, they, they, they created sort of the landscape for a new earth and then descended to ours. And now yeah. we just live in like a world that we don't even know or a lot of people don't even know, you don't even walk around and think about, is a world created by this, and it's the world that they wanted. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the way we're taught history 
is essentially with nation states. Everything before the era of the nation state is kind of vague. Yeah. And then, you get, <laughs> the, the, then you get to nation states. Purposely, state. purposely, by the right, way. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And, and as soon as nation states are established, we're taught each one of them as like, you know, what in philosophical terms would be called a windowless monad. Yes. You know, it's got nothing to do with anything else. It's not interconnected in any way. And history is just sort of these, like, you know, sock em bopper robots smashing blindly together. They're slugging it out. A left to the jaw, and... Oh, my block is knocked off. You can rock em, sock em with the rock em, sock em robots by Marx. Yes. But something like, to talk about this idea of detachment, Liz, that um, one of the uh, biggest, most profitable military contractors on Earth... Executive Outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, what a horrifying name, by the yeah, way. Yeah, totally. Uh, Horrible. I mean, I talk about the SS. Uh, yeah, Executive Outcomes was started by this guy, Aben Barlow, essentially to reconstitute the security state and the Gestapo in South Africa during the apartheid era after apartheid fell apart. Uh, he could see apartheid coming, and so he hired as many veterans as he could of the uh, South African Bureau of Strategic uh, Bureau of State Security, pardon me, which was kind of like their CIA, and the again another horrifying name, the Civil Cooperation Bureau, <laughs> uh, wh which was their Gestapo, and turned this state apparatus into a private company. Mm. And um, one of the key points I think to make about all of this. Uh, one of the the sort of detached shadow state entities that people least like to talk about is Nazism, uh, because the Third Reich never ended. Right. It it never stopped. What yes. happened was that the people canny and slick enough to detach from the nation state ended up reconstituting the Third Reich on the level of a shadow state mm. or a paranational entity. It, it went from being a thing with, you know, geographical borders and an alleged, you know, political and bureaucratic hierarchy to this kind of malleable, semi-porous, multinational, motile organization that didn't necessarily have uh, the same leaders at any given time, that wasn't necessarily involved in the same uh, national interests at any given time. And um, something, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but um, one of the things these, uh, these shadow states need is territory in which to experiment. Yeah. Territory, mm. territory in which proving to grounds. play. Exactly, proving grounds. Places to play out their ideas and to demonstrate to potential clientele, yes, you know, we can do X. Mm -hmm. And so... Certain states, essentially created by the CIA, like various dictatorships in Latin America, they weren't just dictatorships because that was more convenient for American policy or because these countries had you know, natural resources that we wanted. They were also proving grounds, exactly like you're talking about. They were places where these organizations could be given tasks and assignments, and we could sort of sit back and go like, oh, okay, interesting. Mm. And, and these places often included interface points where various sort of post-national shadow state entities could uh, exchange materials and personnel and money and mm -hmm. ideas. And that, I think, is kind of what we're generally building toward here. Yeah, one thing before we get into in more detail these sort of proving grounds, which I think that's such a... Great way to put that. Um, I just want to pinpoint something you said that I think is very interesting. You brought up, um, you know, the nation state and philosophically the monad, right? And I just want to say, like, just to add to that really quickly, that the reason why, um, you know, that history and that narrative persists is because liberalism as a philosophy, as an ideology, requires a subject that is thought of as a monad, that we are all yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. enclosed individuals, monads with no social or familiar or um, 
any other kind of political or any kind of other bond to each other. And the, the only way that we exist with one another is through a negotiation, um, through a contract with each other in a marketplace. That's how liberalism yes. demands uh, the world be seen. And so it's not a coincidence that the history we're taught, whether it's how we started this episode on the kind of official narrative of post-war you know, with, you know, the United States, of course, being the, the, the subject of history there, but, or, or the, you know, the way we say, well, we don't really know anything about before the nation state, it's kind of hazy, but then the nation state emerges and this is this new thing is because that history, you know, that has to be told that, that the world has always been governed by, you know, monad entities, the nation state or individuals negotiating with each other in a global marketplace or in a social marketplace or a political marketplace, uh, various rights or disagreements or what have you as a way of reifying the liberal world order. Yes. So this, so this is, this is all, and you know, <laughs> we always make a joke about, you know, we're all eating from the trash can of ideology, but this is a perfect example of exactly why trying to understand how something like, you know, a claim that we're making in this episode that the Third Reich never ended, which sounds possibly totally absurd and insane, is actually true, is because you have to kind of break away from this governing you know, liberal ideology and exactly. liberal history narrative in order to understand actually um, a sort of the, the kind of different story that we're trying to tell of how the contemporary world order has emerged. Yeah, this this is exactly what Marx was talking about in that famous sack of potatoes analogy. Yeah, exactly, totally. Yeah, that you know we are we are educated to behave like a sack of potatoes in that if you pour more water into a bucket of water, you don't have two water. You know, you just it become <laughs> it becomes one it becomes one new thing. Right, but right, right. A, a sack of potatoes, it's just a bunch of separate potatoes. They don't yeah. add up to anything new. And bumping and against we, each other and sometimes bruising, but like nothing else. Right. We are taught to think of history in essentially that way. On that note, let's jump in because we mentioned proving grounds. We mentioned, um, you know, we kind of teased like, oh, we're going to get into that later in the episode. So we should just get into it all right now. Previously in this sort of like uh, unofficial series, we had mentioned um, various colonies that were set up. I guess you could call them colonies that were set up uh, post, you know, post-World War II. We had mentioned... Colonia Dignidad, which we're going to get into, but that's not the only, that's not the only one or the only instance of, of this sort of, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I want to say just like, uh, I, I think of it as like, um, a bunch of rats scattering the globes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like something was like, like a trash can, like. It was like the, the Soviets knocked over the Nazi trash can and all the rats scattered. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's a reason they call them rat lines. Yes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to mention before we get into this is that, is that well, while we're getting into this, actually, it's a good little segue in here, is that, is that in our last episode about the Veiled Prophet, I talked a little bit about some comparisons between sort of these post-Confederate organizations and the Free Corps. Right. Um, yeah. And one thing I, and we also touched on, or rather I guess touched on, um, that one of the um, uh, uh, one of the uh, sort of progenitors of the of the Vale Prophet Society was a guy who had at one point fled to Mexico to a Confederate colony, mm -hmm. and there were a ton of Confederate colonies. Not a ton, but there were a handful. Actually, that's the opposite of a ton of Confederate colonies <laughs> in South America. A one few was notably, a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which is, I mean, uh, twenty thousand, for instance, ended up in Brazil. Uh, yes. where, where they still, basically the descendants still live today and essentially kind of LARP as Confederates in this little um, village they have. And also I found out that one of the members of Austin Mutantes 
His dad was a confederado, which is which is kind of funny. Oh, wow. There's two I well, really want. Well, that's wanna... kind of a bummer. Yeah. Well, I don't. It doesn't mean he's a confederado. I, no, I, I know, man. but it's just like very strange. Well, it's it's I'm also gonna... like when you think about how uh, slavery was actually ended in uh, Brazil. Oh God, I know. Like right? 20 years at 23 years after it was ended in the U.S. Um, well, officially, but it was still yes, going on. Literally, yeah. still happening today. Yeah. I was gonna say 23 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. But not even. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- there's two others I wanted to mention, though. One is Nueva Australia, which was uh, a, a, a group of Australian sort of uh, utopian socialists led by this fucking reporter. Let's, you know, raising the eyebrow here, named William Lane, who was like a big prohibition guy, which actually, respect for that. Uh, they moved to, I believe, Paraguay and broke up over race mixing and drinking laws. He did he he wanted uh none of the first and quite a few of the latter. Um <laughs> the other Are one you is telling me that something involving Australia was racist and like It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean a group of Australian col- uh, communists literally moved I mean they called themselves communists moved from Australia to fucking Paraguay and were racist. It's like dude you already live in a colony that yeah, you that's... can be as racist as you want it. It's. I mean, this is a total side note, but it's 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 weird to remember how many people sort of latched onto ideas of communism or socialism in the era before Marxism was kind of the universal definition of yes. that idea. Yeah. And how many yeah. utopian societies there were with very different definitions of utopian. Yes. Right. I, yes. I come from one of those. I am here specifically here. Because one branch of my family moved from Germany to be part of a Christian anarchist commune. No shit. Uh, wow. Yeah, r- run by like a charismatic German preacher. Mm, and, well. and, there, <laughs> and and there were mm. um, Missouri is a weird state in a lot of ways. Yes. And there were uh, communes and utopian groups all over the state. And of yeah, course, yeah, that's yeah. Part, part of the reason Joseph Smith came here. Is because there was essentially uh, nobody to stop him, and still you can find cities all over the state with made up Mormon names. There's a yeah. city called Nauvoo, not yes. very far yes. from here. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. Just he just made shit up. I think plan. Jesse <laughs> James or no Butch Cassidy. I think's dad lived in Nauvoo at one point. I was just oh wow. Him. Yeah, Jesse uh, James lived right around where I am at this moment. <laughs> among There's other a, places. There's, a, there's another colony I want to mention, too, also run by Germans, although none of these people seem particularly charismatic, and I think the type of religion that they practice we would probably find strange and terrible. But um, it's called Nueva Germany, or excuse me, Nueva Germania, also in Paraguay. And this one was established by a guy named Bernard Forster, who was married to, you'll never guess, Nietzsche's busted-ass sister, Elizabeth, who famously... <laughs> The, the famously one. anti-Semitic, <laughs> insane. Like I, I think, cripplingly anti-Semitic would be a good way to describe her. <laughs> so they they left because they thought Germany and Europe had become too soft on Jews. Mind you, this is in 1887. Yeah, they were incredible. like, oh, this, this is. They're too nice to Jews here. Uh, they brought 14 families with them to Paraguay. A bunch of them immediately died of lockjaw. A lot of other people just left. Uh, the, the remainder of the people uh, had to deal with a leprosy out, outbreak. Elizabeth fucking books it. She goes back to Germany to eventually join the Nazi party. Hitler would actually go to her funeral, I believe. Um, Bernard basically swindled the rest of them that were there, which, by the way, as a Jew, maybe that's why you <laughs> left Europe, Bernard, is because you couldn't handle the competition. Uh, took the rest of their fucking money, gets crazy in debt, and then, bam, off himself with strychnine like, at a hotel in Asuncion. I'm the dumbest guy in Germany, but I'm the smartest guy in America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, I, can you imagine, like, these fucking, like, frail, like, just German racists going up the river, Hearts of Darkness style in Paraguay, and then getting to their horrible, like, little spot that they'd picked out because these people were not farmers, and then immediately dying of lockjaw. I don't even know you could die of lockjaw. Can you just you not come? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're talking about today is a little place called Colonia Dignidad. And uh, when Michael mentioned a charismatic German preacher, um, that raised yeah. my eyebrows a little bit because we are also <laughs> dealing yep. with a charismatic German preacher. This one named Paul Schaefer. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Schaefer, come on over. 
Now, Paul Schaefer, born, I think, 1921, he... Uh, you know, when he was grew up, joined the Hitler Youth as a teenager, eventually tried to join the SS, could not, possibly <laughs> due to the fact that this guy was so fucking dumb that when he was a kid, he tried to untie his shoe with a fork and through a completely predictable set of events, ends up literally poking out one of his eyes. He, I think, later told people he lost it, he lost it as a war wound, which, to be clear... I would also do. I would not tell people yeah. the real story there. Because that's some, like, gummo shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so people, so a, a lot of histories I've read of this guy, um, some of them claim that he was he was in the SS or that he had served in the Eastern Front. That is a lie. He actually, or I think the people were probably just confused, he uh, spent the war as a corporal in the Wehrmacht in uh, occupied France in, in a medical unit. So I think he was in just a field hospital. Anyways, World War II ends. Uh, this guy is, like many of these scumbags, lost. And he's, a wand- he's wandering around, and he gets really into this um, branch of evangelicalism. Uh, evangelicism? That's how you pronounce it? Evangelicalism. Uh, called the Evangelical Free Church, which I'm not super familiar with, but uh, apparently spawned a lot of weird people. Apparently, According to, to Steve Snyder, their advice of you, he was heavily influenced by a guy named William M. Branahan, uh, who was a healer that also very much influenced uh, our good friend Jim Jones. Uh, and mm. who, at the l- end of his life, said he was a prophet. He believed in something called annihilationism, which is, I think, means there's no hell. You're just annihilated, which, uh, to be honest with you, sounds better than hell. Like, if I was going there, <laughs> does sound better. There's, uh, some in- uh, there's, like, more than a couple interesting comparisons here uh, with Jonestown. I'll oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Listen, listeners out there, if any of your friends starts getting really into religion, any kind of religion, I don't care what kind of religion, but any, they start getting really into religion and they're like, hey, I'm going to move to Uruguay. Tell them not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if your religion requires relocation to South America, the batting average on that is like <laughs> zero out of 100. Yes, <laughs> yeah. He has an incredible kill-death ratio. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go to Guyana because <laughs> yeah. your your prophet decided that that's where Christ is coming back. Yeah. For that oh, matter, don't go to Utah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've been there. It's not not a pleasant place. I'd rather no. go to Guyana than Utah, although <laughs> under tourist circumstances only. Yeah. So this, in 1954, uh, he he hooks up with this guy named Hugo Barr and sort of gets trained as a preacher and starts wandering around, sort of as like a. So, so Schaefer starts wandering up and down Germany playing acoustic guitar, uh, you know, sort of a Dylan-esque figure if Dylan was really into uh, evan- uh, evangelical uh, Christianity and also uh, molesting children. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to save somebody. So this guy um, sets up a home for war widows and children about 1960 and then immediately gets accused of molesting the children there. Like, I think only months passed before people were like, yeah, he's raping my kid. His record of child molestation, I was just going to say, is uh, really sort of remarkable in its scope. I mean, eventually yeah. he's importing children from halfway around the world and shit. He, yeah. he is, this guy wants to molest children more than any other child molester I've ever heard of. Yeah, like we, you know, I think I've probably described Epstein before as like one of the most prolific child molesters sort of in recent history, but I, I'm almost positive that Schaefer has not beat by like a lot. Yeah. And Epstein had, he had it comparatively easy. He had jets and shit. This guy's yeah. a lunch pail, you know, nine to five child molester. This Absolutely. guy's got one eye. I mean, he's got he's one like- eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he starts, he starts really like, Entering into a refrain, which will keep up for most of the rest of his life, which is that communism is going to come to the rest of Germany, uh, that, that only his specific brand of Christianity can save people's soul, and that Germany, sort of pre-modern Germany, uh, which, by the way, here's another little tip for listeners out there. If anyone you hang out with starts <laughs> idolizing pre-modern Germany in any Oof. way, maybe they're just like, I like the pastoral landscapes of, uh, you know, the fields of Bavaria. I would edge away from them. Uh, I think runes are cool. Like, yeah, mm, yeah. If you uh, know a rune guy, don't hang out with the rune guy. Um, 
So he, he of course, uh, starts getting investigated about 1961 by the public prosecutor in Bonn. And he splits to the Middle East, which I have been unable to find out where he was there or what he was doing there. Um, but yeah, also several, not a good sign. Several conflicting reports about what the hell was going on, but I haven't, I haven't seen any like actual documented proof of what the guy was doing. I mean, it should be noted that around this time, like Otto Scorzani uh, was floating around uh, various countries there. He had, I think he'd already set up the Paladin Group, sort of his like um, mercenary firm. But yeah. I know at one point they were training the security services of, uh, of Egypt, basically modeling them along the lines of the Gestapo. Yeah, I think that was in about 55. Paladin Group's history is kind of hard to trace because it actually existed for like 10 years before yeah. it was incorporated and had a name. But I think it was the mid-50s that they trained Nasef security forces. And then like 1960 or so was when uh, Scorzani uh, uh, had brought the Green Berets over yes. for special, special yes. training in Spain. To be clear, like the Green Berets, who later fought, you know, very famously and brutally in Vietnam, were trained in that type of warfare by Otto Scorzani, the completely unrepented, I would actually say rabid Nazi, who was basically like Hitler's Rambo. I, I guess while we're talking about this, uh, should we talk about Sofindus for a minute? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah, you yeah, yeah, need yeah. that background? Yeah. So, yes. um, uh, we were talking earlier about the way the SS kind of mirrored the functions of all the different departments of the German government. And one of them uh, was a service called the Auslandssicherheitsdienst, uh, which was the foreign security service. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of like their equivalent of a CIA type group. And in 1938, when the Nazis invaded Poland and the war really got going, uh, an Ausland SD agent uh, named Johannes Bernhardt realized, like, shit, we, we could lose this war. I mean, there are a lot of people who are going to be fighting against us. This was before the, the pact between uh, Yeshislav Molotov and Joachim von Ribbentrop, so they thought, you know, maybe Russia's going to attack us immediately. Uh, and he got in contact with these guys in Spain because there was a uh, Germany to Spain network that the Nazis had used to smuggle weapons to the Spanish fascists yes. during the Spanish Civil War. And um, he got in touch with these guys again and said, hey, what if we use these same, uh, these same networks to smuggle money? Because if we lose this war, I don't want to get my shit taken away from me. And this was not just, not just the you know, accumulated wealth of the Nazi government, but this is after mass confiscation of property from Jews. Mm -hmm. so and and uh, mass confiscations of artwork and national treasures right. and gold reserves. Absolutely. Yeah, so they've, they've got an enormous amount of uh, both money and stuff worth an enormous amount of money. And they start this group called, in Spanish, the uh, Sociedad Financiera Industrial, Ooh, uh, which... The lisp there. <laughs> si, es Castilian, mi amor. Um, <laughs> The uh, Industrial Finance Society, which is usually referred to by the acronym SOFINDUS, which in English spells so find us. Um, I know. Well, th that, by the <laughs> way, people will dispute me on this. <laughs> but that is, I'm, 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 I'm reading through that, uh, that through the lens of synchronicity. Yeah. Oh, come on. It's got to be. And um, one source I looked at said that during 1944 alone, just in terms of gold, not cash, not bank accounts, not art, just gold. Uh, so Fiendu smuggled out in a single year the equivalent of almost $21 billion worth of gold. Jesus. So, yeah, we're looking at tens and tens of billion dollars, tens of billions of dollars a year for seven years, eight years. So an enormous amount of money. Mm. And then when the war ends and the Nazis have obviously lost, Sofindus moves from the business of smuggling uh, money to smuggling Nazis. And one of the Nazis who used the Sofindus rat line was Otto Skorzeny, who lived, as far as I can tell, pretty much peacefully um, oh, yeah. the rest of his life in fascist Spain. And I even discovered uh, a part 
he found it. He kind of invented the modern private private military contract. It's, it's basically like yeah. the yeah. first really mo- like of what we know of as like a PMC today. His group, the Paladin group, was basically like the progenitors of it. They were the, right. they were the inventors of it. And not to use the word progenitors twice in an episode. Uh, but, you know, imagine I said a different word there. <laughs> they they worked with the CIA. They worked with the special forces. And I even found that um, at one point, Otto Skorzeny was the official European sales representative for the American company, Armco Steel. Yep. He was just completely unashamedly out there announcing where he was and what his name was. Yeah. Uh, it, well, he, was also, could, he was married to Jean Marchac's, uh like niece too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he anyone was, could have discovered where he was at any point, but I, I suppose because uh, he was in fascist Spain and because he'd worked with the CIA and mm-hmm. the American army, no one was interested in arresting him. By so the way, he the, also worked. Uh, 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 Israel has has a reputation for having gone after Nazis uh, after yes. World War II. Um, but one person who was. Uh, not on that list was Otto Skorzeny, who did work with uh, with Israel, who had, by the way, f- of course, full knowledge with who he was and what he had done. Yeah. I, I don't know that this is true, but I have heard, allegedly, that two Israeli, um, I don't know what agency they would have been part of, maybe the Mossad, uh, a, a male and female agent were sent out to uh, arrest Skorzeny at a bar that he frequented. By pretending that they were a couple and they wanted to have a three-way with him. Whoa. <laughs> and they convinced him, yeah, we want to go back to your house and have a three-way. So they go back to his house and they think they're about to arrest him. And then from behind him, they hear the click of a gun. And, okay, so how did you figure out who I was? And that's Incredible. how Scorsese ended up working for Israel. And, and to Allegedly. be clear, like, Scorsese was like a real-life James Bond type. Like, he was extremely yeah. wild. And by the yeah. way, we, this is an anti-James Bond podcast, so I don't mean that's a, <laughs> a, a, a yeah. comparison. Oh, Blofeld, the villain from James Bond, is based on Otto Skorzeny. Yeah, yeah the, the guy scars, who, right? Yeah, the guy with the scar who pets the cat. The name Scarface comes from Otto Skorzeny. Yeah, 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 yeah. He got them dueling, I think. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, every, big... basic, if you look at a portrait of any German who was born po- sort of pre-World War II, if they're from the yeah. upper classes, they have very oftentimes tasteful scars sort of uh, crisscrossing their faces. And those were signs of basically like manhood and virility that they got while dueling at their fucked up schools that they went to. You know, it's like all British upper class people were sort of brutally molested at their private schools. <laughs> and all yes. Germans were also probably happened to them as well, considering what we know now about uh, sort of post-World War II German history and, uh, uh, let's say, rather uh, extremely liberal attitudes towards uh, pedophilia. But uh, they, 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 that their sort of equivalent to that was just stabbing each other in the faces with, with rapiers. Yeah. Um, and one time I, I was telling an ex-girlfriend of mine about that, and she didn't believe me, so I showed her a photo of German, like, dualist guys. Yeah. And then she was like, oh, dude, that's so hot. So See, apparently it, works. it still works. Fellas, <laughs> if you're out there, you're young, you're virile, start dueling your boys. It's a, it's a totally safe thing to do during COVID. Duel the swords are really your long. boys. <laughs> <laughs> So back, back to Schaefer, right? So we last saw him. He's in the Middle East with a couple of his lieutenants. Somehow in here, he meets the Chilean ambassador to Germany, who I've read didn't know exactly what the deal was with Schaefer in terms of child molestation and sort of uh, tells him very excitedly about how there's a lot of land in Chile, totally ready to homestead. Uh, I think right now we should get into a little background on Chile and Chile's yeah. relationship to Nazism, because Chile, uh, much like a c- sort of select few other South American countries, and then eventually basically every South American country, definitely had like a pretty robust relationship uh, to Nazism and and really in general to Germany. I mean, 
One of the big things that, that I've, I've run into a lot when, when reading about Germany, even before this, is that a lot of sort of the upper classes there, and certainly a lot of their military men, were trained by Prussian army instructors who went there sort of, uh, I can't remember which war it was after, I think after the Franco-Prussian War. They split Germany and, uh, and, and went to, to Chile and taught at military academies. They taught at high schools. And from that, we actually have Nazi parties emerging pretty early on in the 20th century. Explicitly called yeah. the Nazis, N A C I S. I don't. I'm sure you can correct my pronunciation, but <laughs> oh, that was correct. Uh, <laughs> there's there's a an interesting just sort of quirk of history in this that um, during the the huge waves of migration from Europe to the United States in uh, the 19th century that were caused by things like the 1848 revolutions and the the massive uh, agricultural famine that preceded that. Uh, we had all these national immigration quotas. And so uh, lots and lots of people got turned away from attempting to immigrate into the United States. A number of South American countries, and particularly Argentina and Chile, had very open uh, immigration policies because they had enormous amounts of kind of unworked but usable land. Yep. And were in interested in bringing in as many immigrants as they could. So um, you'll find, for example, there are tons of people from Argentina who consider themselves Italian, uh, who yeah. have Italian names, who speak Italian. And partly because of that, uh, there was a base of support for both fascism and Nazism in um, South America and in the Southern Cone, Argentina and Chile in particular, because there were so many uh, Europeans there already when those movements started in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, and in Argentina in particular, of course, you had the, the rise of Juan Perón. Yeah. And, his, and, I mean, he was sort of... I think Perón is, is a very interesting precursor to Trump in a lot of ways. Mm. And he, he sort of didn't exactly have a political philosophy. Yeah, a lot of people uh, call him a fascist, but I, I think that's untrue. And, like, certainly... A lot of sort of the left wing Peronists uh, would would also disagree with that as well. Yeah, but yeah. Pero, Peronism Peron is like almost its own, that is like its own thing. Yeah, you, I don't think you can pin down you know Peronismo enough just to call it fascist. But yeah, he definitely did like the Nazis. Oh, uh, yeah. oh, yeah, and yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He definitely was willing to harbor ex Nazis and to you know bring them in during the war on visits mm -hmm. of state. Right. You know, while, while the United States were at war with them. So um, Latin America and particularly the Southern Cone are kind of ready-made for uh, Nazis and fascists wanting to escape Central Europe. Yeah. And, and, and with Chile in particular, um, they actually, the Nazis there in 1938 tried to do a coup. And, and, yeah. and take over the country. This was, I have read about a lot of coups in my life. And usually, one of the things you want to do when you do a coup is you got to take over the radio station, you got to take over, obviously, where the politicians are, and you probably got to figure out something about the barracks in the Capitol. What yeah. these guys do is they take over the Social Security building and then immediately all get shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. We're going to cut it, it by 1.1%. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, I'm not sure. Maybe they were appealing to the older people there. I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I don't know. There was a guy I wrote a lot of notes about and who I've known about for a while but got much more deeply interested in while researching this episode named Miguel Serrano. This is I, – I, I haven't really figured out a way to work it in, so I don't think we will. We'll probably do another episode involving this guy. But just real quick of, about Serrano, and he's a good – I don't, couldn't say he's emblematic of Chilean Nazism because he certainly has many different characteristics than a lot of those guys. Um, but he was a Chilean guy raised by Prussian teachers. Uh, after I'm not going to get into his, his, his beginnings, but during World War II, he is a Nazi in Chile. He is not a member of the German Nazi Party. He's a member of a local Nazi party. Starts talking to a guy at the Italian embassy and an SS member attached to the German embassy who turn him on to the occult aspects yeah. of fascist ideology. He starts mixing it with esotericism, Nazism, with esotericism, Nazism, Hinduism, and Kundalini yoga. Uh, he, he eventually joins a strange sort of order, order uh, who swore allegiance to, I quote, a mysterious Brahmanical elite supposedly based in the, Hilima, in the Himalayas 
who were essentially perfect Aryans. And he had this crazy view that, well, I actually wouldn't even want to call that crazy. He had this view that Hitler was the, uh, was the god Wotan, and he was here because of, uh, you know, Kali Yuga, and he was like part of a perfect divine being. Uh, you might think that this would get him laughed out of, you know, whatever beer hall there was in Chile. It no. did not. Uh, he and his friends, of which at this point there were a lot, would co- <laughs> they would sit down and sort of cross their legs, and this is during World War II, commune with Hitler on the astral plane. Because that SS man at the embassy had told them that, yes, the war is fought in the air, on the earth, and in the water. But it's also fought in the astral plane. This is a member of the SS who was selected to go to Chile told him that. Uh, after World War II, this guy goes to all these different spots. All he, By the way, does not believe that Hitler died. His master had told him that he had a vision of Hitler after his death and that he was in the hollow earth. Which also, of course, could be the bunker which he blew his brains out in. Perhaps. Yeah. Nah, he definitely killed himself there. Uh, anyways, this guy eventually becomes sort of a leading, well, I don't know leading, but a big Jungian, friends with Hermann Hess, uh, and eventually uh, the, the Chilean diplomat to, uh, or excuse me, ambassador to Yugoslavia. And <laughs> Austria, which is insane in the 70s. Uh, uh, anyways, he split, uh, he split after Andy came to power. But that is... Uh, that is like a guy who came from the milieu of the country, which we are talking about, right? This yeah, is a country uh, incredibly friendly to these ideas. It's, it's worth mentioning that there, there have been various strains of not even Nazism per se, but what you might call esoteric Hitlerism yes. in, in Latin America ever since World War II. And um, one of my favorite writers, uh, Roberto Bolaño, mm-hmm. uh, is Chilean. And if you ever want to sort of see... A fictional account of his stuff. He wrote uh, an amazing book called uh, "Nazi Literature in the Americas," uh, huh. which is it's a fake dictionary of fictional uh, North and South American Nazi and fascist novelists and poets and polemicists and all kinds of other shit. And he he lands at least once on like every bizarre strain of kind of post World War II like esoteric fascism or mystical Hitlerism, or whatever else, you know, managed to survive in these odd little pockets, particularly in South and Central America. In India as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the big strains came from there, from a German, but, but, but in India. I don't know what it is, but when, for some reason, when you mix Nazism with yoga, you get some, like, that is like one of those dialectical processes that, like, you can't predict. It's like the, the Philosopher's Stone or whatever. It turns it into something completely insane. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Paul, so Schaefer gets to uh, Schaefer gets to Chile, and he buys a big ass fucking ranch south of Santiago. Uh, excuse me, south of Santiago, that was called El Lavadero, and he starts a nonprofit. That is the thing that you need to keep in mind during all of this is that during the entire time this is running, until like the mid nineties. In fact, I actually until the mid nineties is what I assume, but it literally could still be a nonprofit today, and so. It's- I, yeah. I just looked this up. No shit. It's a tourist resort. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, via Bavaria. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Yeah, I've seen yeah. some very weird YouTube videos of travel bloggers going there. <laughs> uh, anyways, this thing is 4,000 acres, fucking huge. Eventually becomes 37,000 acres. And it's surrounded on one side by really tall mountains, which is good if you want to have a compound. Mountains are good. And on the other side by a very fast river. Also very good. And he starts something called the Society... Uh, all right, I'm going to say this, and then you're going to have to correct me. Sociedad okay. Benefactora e Educational Dignidad. I think it's, it's Sociedad Benefactora e Educacional Dignidad. Okay, well, I can never... Beautiful. <laughs> Gracias. Anyways, he gets around 300 settlers uh, to come over the next three years. So this is from 61 to 63. Uh, and and he, he really gets them to come by having his guys back in Germany tell them that a Soviet attack is coming. A Soviet attack is coming. And I think people living now, including myself, don't really grasp how paranoid people were back then about yeah, how yeah. the threat of nuclear war and the threat of a Soviet invasion. And he really played on those fears. Yeah, I mean, nuclear war itself is so surreal that 
especially if you're living in a world where that has only fairly recently become a reality at all. Yeah. It's like, if someone tells you there's going to be a nuclear explosion that takes out the entirety of Central Europe, your reaction, I think, would kind of be like, why not? Like, yeah. this, sh- this shouldn't be possible anyway. How exactly. the fuck do I know that's not going to happen? Yeah. I don't think that people our age actually understand, I mean, even in America, how omnipresent the threat of, like, nuclear holocaust was. And, oh, like, yeah. Like, I mean, I talked to, I talked to my mom about that all the time. Her growing, she grew up, um, you know, she's a military brat and for some of that time was down in Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And like, you know, they just were like, I mean, every day you, you've got drills for in case of nuclear bomb, everyone get under their desk, which, okay, pause on that for a second. (laughs) But also it's like, you know, I mean, everyone thought up until the fall of the Soviet Union that, you know, an atom bomb could be dropped at any given moment. And I don't think that people, you know, our age, like, appreciate that kind of existential pressure that filled and was so easily manipulated, not just in America, but abroad. I would Uh, argue, though, that the COVID stuff gives us not a taste of that necessarily, but it's a similar flavor, right? Like, this sort of omnipresent... Uh, sense of dread that we have and that we can do basically nothing about or climate change yeah yeah, yeah climate change I, I was gonna say climate change because to me it's the COVID interesting stuff, yeah climate is an interesting comparison i think i think the COVID is almost like the inverse because in, in the case of the nuclear bomb it's not happening anywhere but could happen at any time mm. whereas in the case of COVID, it's happening everywhere but everyone to go on living sort of has to believe that's not going to happen to me you know, right, the, right, the, right. The, it's like an the, inverted, yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're kind of, you know, yin and yang. As long as we're talking about young yins and esotericism and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about what was going on in this colony. So, you've got this psycho preacher from Germany. He's got about three hundred followers uh, out on this farm that he's building, and uh, and things get pretty weird pretty quickly. Um, they start, first of all, they start adopting Chilean children, which, by the way, again, my third bit of advice here. If your boy is like, hey, I started a farm in a remote part of Chile and I'm adopting children, um, again, don't hang out with them anymore. Stop doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not, only, not only adopting children, but um, using uh, his hospital to abduct children. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about what they had there real quick. They had a factory, which, by the way, it turned out later they were making arms and chemical weapons in. Yeah, yes. Uh, they had a hospital, which it was sort of famous for. They had a restaurant, literally a rest stop, like side of the highway restaurant you could go to. Uh, they had, of course, a ton of different, like, you know, uh, grain milling, et cetera, like a big working farm. And the thing is about the farm is that you had to work about 16 hours a day for no pay, which doesn't seem great. Uh, and also, Schaefer would molest your child. That's the other thing here, is that basically yes. every boy who was at Colonia Dignidad during this period, and in fact, during the entirety of its existence, was molested by Schaefer. Yeah, and he was notably very, very against uh, his, his adult subjects having children. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, I'm sure had something to do with his bizarre religious beliefs, but I wonder... To what degree it may also have had to do with their their protectiveness mm. about children if they had had them. Yeah, I wonder. My my thing is that I think I was reading something like only thirty kids were born through this mm-hmm. entire yeah like entire yeah. era that the colony was active, and they were all basically sequestered away from the mothers in the in the in the hospital at the colony, which was actually quite large and and. Um, by all accounts, I'm actually like a very good hospital, which is kind of a strange little thing, yeah. but, um, but that my sense or, you know, my, uh, let's say feminine instinct is that he understood that if the women were, were bearing children, that they would, uh, probably, you know, women will do anything to protect their kids <laughs> and, and, and he would not have been able to continue you know, what was an essential part of his operation. But, you know, the kind of twist to that, which is interesting, is always like, okay, so he didn't actually see this as a kind of religious experiment that was going to continue past his death because, like, they weren't actually, like, 
uh, reproducing members of the colony. Yeah, 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 and that that brings up the the fact that as as we just mentioned that this this large and well supplied hospital, he would invite um, Chilean families from the poor countryside to bring their children there and then abduct the boys to molest them. Yeah, and that he also uh, he also adopted boys from orphanages in Germany to molest them. And the very existence of the hospital calls up the uh, weird excellence of their resources. Right. Yes. How they had all this shit and well, where it came from. Well, one thing is that, that I found reported a couple of places, including I think in Lavenda's book, uh, uh, is that they had excellent plastic surgeons. <sighs> and that combined with the fact that this was a meeting point for many of the people who had escaped Nazi Germany during the rat lines – Yes. Really makes you think about a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This was um, when I was when I was talking about interface points earlier between those, you know, between all these shadow state entities. This is exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah you know, this, absolutely. The kind of place where they meet and and trade. So he continues basically unmolested uh, up until the 1970s, um, when it appears that Allende is going to be elected president, and during that time. He comes into contact with a group named Patria, Patria y Libertad, uh, who have as a member one Michael Townley. And by the way, this is before Pinochet, uh, well, excuse me, before Allende gets elected, before Pinochet takes over for him, uh, Patria y Libertad uh, start, start basically rustling up trouble, knowing that Allende is going to be elected. Once he is elected, they start really going crazy. I mean, there's assassinations, there's kidnappings, there's bombings. And uh, they are joined by the son of a Ford Motors, I believe, executive, who we talked about, I think, on our, a little bit on our, our podcast with Steven Snyder. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Cruz, him. Uh, named Michael Townley. And yes, Michael. Uh, yeah. The, Townley. <laughs> Please, the, go um, talk about him. Yeah, the, in retrospect, you know, now that we know that Pinochet was, was going to follow, Patria y Libertad, they're, they're, they're kind of like the, like the stormtroopers, you know, in advance of Pinochet. Mm. Uh, they kind of prepare the way for him. And this guy, Michael Townley, shows up, and um, he's got all kinds of conflicting things going on, uh, in addition to having been the son of a, a uh, motor company executive in Chile. Uh, he is working for the CIA, but he is also deeply tied to uh, a group that we are going to have to talk about in some horrible terms called the DINA. Mm. Um, the uh, Dirección de Inteligencia Nacional, uh, which under Pinochet, uh, it, it means basically the National Intelligence Directorate. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of a combination of a foreign intelligence service like the CAA and like Gestapo. Yeah. Yes. Um, he works for them and for the CIA at the same time. And he is a very frequent guest at Colonia Dignidad, where he is involved in all sorts of... Uh, evil projects, including the assassination uh, of a number of important figures from the Allende regime, he first uh, tries to assassinate a guy named Carlos Prats, who was a, um, he was a general, he was the head of Chilean uh, armed forces under Allende, who then he serves as defense minister and interior minister and had, had a number of other jobs as well. Uh, he fucked up, actually. He didn't kill Carlos Prats, but the Dina did kill uh, Prats in, uh, when he was in exile in Argentina in 74. And um, I guess, uh, do you want to talk about Orlando Letelier in, in this connection? Uh, we, I think we talked about it in the Snyder episode, but, but uh, Letelier was an official in Allende's government that uh, had to flee obviously, after, uh, after Pinochet took power. I believe he was actually arrested and kind of like beaten around, put on a prison ship, and yeah. then he was allowed to go to America. Where, what, what, the think tank that he worked for is still around, but I can't remember its name. It, but it had national yeah. well, and, I'm sure, policy in the title of it. <laughs> what, what's remarkable about Letelier was not just that he was killed in the United States by Asian Sadina, that he was fucking blown up in DuPont Circle yeah. in D.C., but that... Um, when we talk about uh, Pinochet's Chile, this is something that really, really was born home for me, you know, doing research for this episode. 
there were, of course, all kinds of countries in Central and South America with CIA-backed, tyrannical, authoritarian regimes. But Chile uh, really, really became, as you put it, the proving ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, more than any other place, this is where they tried out every experiment, everything, everything. they were interested in. Yes. And one of those major experiments was uh, a group of people called the Chicago Boys. Sure. Yeah. Everyone were, knows I'm a big, big fan of these <laughs> Chicago Boys. I, 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 I can't believe Liz. Al Capone was at Colonia Dignity. <laughs> no. I can't believe the band Chicago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I figured Liz would know about this. Uh, the Well, Liz, do you want to explain the Chicago Boys? The Chicago Boys are, I mean, that's it's sort of a, um, you know, catch-all term for a group of uh, Chicago school economists who were basically, um, you know, when you talk about, when pe you know, everyone throws around the term neoliberalism, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't need to get into my feelings about that. But when we, there are actually specific, um, and, and it sounds crazy, but regional strains of neoliberal economic theory. And you have the kind of um, ordo liberals in Germany, you have the Austrians, and the two schools in America, one being in Chicago and one being at uh, George Mason University, excuse me. And, um, you know, so the Chicago boys were sort of deputized uh, to basically try out, you know, we say proving ground, but Chile became basically an experiment in total neoliberal economic uh, revolution, I mean, I would call it, yeah. where it was, you know, we, we've talked in the past about uh, shock therapy in Russia, which is sort of a like kind of like second coming of what they had tried out in South America in terms of how quickly you can introduce... Um, like devastating market economy into a country. And that's what Chicago was bringing into uh, Chile and they, and doing it, you know, at the behest of, you know, obviously the American government, but also business and, and corporate interests. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was really like if they let Milton Friedman just run a country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or for, absolutely. Or, yeah. Bring in Hayek and let him go wild. Yeah. And um, <laughs> this is kind of incidental, but, uh, one of my favorite facts about them is that when they predictably destroyed the economy of Chile, uh, someone asked Milton Friedman, like, hey, they, they did everything you said, and it's a fucking mess. And Friedman said, yeah, it wasn't free market enough. Oh, they classic. Didn't, <laughs> they didn't go the, far enough. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole yeah. thing. That's the whole thing. It's actually, you know, and that's when, I mean, you know, if we, let me, I'll just say this for a second. That's when, you know, law becomes quite important for uh, neoliberal revolutionaries or counter-revolutionaries, however you want to call them, situate them, in that the law then becomes the essential tool for perfecting, uh, you know, the equilibrium of the markets. That without yeah. restructuring the law, and I'm going to call back and say this is again why I maintain that, you know, Elizabeth Warren is a neoliberal through and through. But through a, using the law as a tool to restructure the entire nation around the market, um, this becomes a like required development in uh, neoliberal governance through the 20th century. Yeah, and and I mention this because part of what's remarkable about the assassination of Orlando Letelier is that he was an economist yes. on top of on top of his government post. And part of what he was doing in D.C. was trying to demonstrate to the world uh, free market economics and austerity are not going to fix anything for anyone. They're, they're just going to destroy my country if you let these people get away with this. And uh, trying to, you know, move not just Chile, but sort of um, economics for, you know, impoverished, disadvantaged nations in general toward more of a kind of like New Deal Keynesian mm -hmm. sort of economics. And um, part of the reason they blew his ass up was that. Right. Was not just that he was opposing their particular regime, but that he was saying, no, there, there's a way for the third world to get out of poverty, you know, and no one wanted him telling that. Yeah. yeah and, um, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that, you know, <laughs> 
another part, another massive part of this, of the neoliberal revolution. And it was dictated again by, we'll say the vanguards at George, George Mason University, which was education reform in order to stifle and eliminate like heterodox economic views that could be yeah. then disseminated through the world. I mean, particularly in economics and political science, the entire scientific turn in the, in the um, academies, the sort of social sciences away from anything um, more holistic and towards a kind of straight science mathematics was, you know, in due part, for stifling all this kind of dissident activity against what this project was trying to do, right? I mean, yeah. these are all, you know, we talk about lattice, like this is all part of it. The way we're talking about history earlier, um, you know, the way they teach it to us as these monads, that something like, you know, the assassination of a Chilean diplomat may seem kind of like recondite to most people, like right. why do I care about that? But then you look at that and put it in the context of, say, Greece in 2008. Mm -hmm. Or us in well, 2008. So wait, for that matter. wait. Let me let me let me say this about Greece too. We were talking about earlier about so find us funneling that gold. Yeah. That gold out of Germany. Well, when the Nazis took over Greece during World War II, the first thing that they did, or one of the first things that they did, was they had their puppet government, or the puppet government they installed in Greece, basically send them, drain the treasuries, send it all to Germany. Yeah. Basically, war loot, but but legal. Right, because, well, I mean, you know, what is what is the law? But they, they, it was officially sanctioned or whatever. Yeah. Um, that money, of course, was never returned. Right. Right. And so, so during during Greece's economic crisis, uh, they the the Greek government tried to uh, tried to get some of that money back. They're like, well, you you never paid us war reparations, right? Like, you are one of the reasons that our our country is is impoverished. And we'd like that money back. And, of course, the, the Christian Democratic government uh, of Germany said no. Yeah, you'd, you'd like to see Angela Merkel's face when someone says, hey, can we have the Nazi gold back? Yes. <laughs> the, the thing that's undergirding you your economy here. Incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I will say, too, like the thing that connects this also to Colonia Dignidad, another thing there is that, is that from reports uh, – Basically, like the ant, like the front rooms at Colonia Dignidad, the, the rooms that they showed to reporters. Uh, well, actually, not to reporters. They didn't let reporters there until the eighties. But the the rooms that guests saw actually had uh, had pictures of of um, the leaders from the Bavarian Christian Democratic Party, uh, like the Bavarian <laughs> local or whatever. Uh, I think it's actually like somewhat a semi autonomous from well, not semi autonomous, but like. Politics worked differently in Bavaria than the rest of Germany, as far as I know. Um, and and they had pictures of their of their presidents. There. So. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, like I, I think we should go back to what Michael said about how, how there's these, these nexus points. Because I want to list just a few of the people who came by Colonia Dignidad in the 60s and then later the 70s. I mean, we have, we have like we mentioned, Michael Townley. We have Pinochet himself, who came a year after he entered power. Uh, we have Gerhard Mertens, who was a member of Scorzani's uh, unit during World War II who actually participated in the raid on Gran Sasso, which rescued Mussolini, uh, and then later became one of the most notorious arms traffickers in the world, who not only worked directly for the army of the United States and the CIA, but, uh, and by the way, this is an SS man, an unrepentant SS man, it wouldn't matter if he was repentant, he was in the fucking SS, uh, who, who would come and every time he stayed at Chile, he would go up to Colonia Dignidad, and they... Yeah, I mean, it's all of these things are connected. Yeah. I mean, Michael Townley met Pinochet in the company of Stefano Della Chai, like you mentioned earlier, at fucking and brought Prince Valerio Borghese, who, like you talked about, the fascism in fucking Italy, who yep. had tried to actually, he was the fucking like 
I mean, I mean, the Black Prince, they called him. He was, during World War II, the head of Italy's frogmen. The, uh, basically, the, and I, oh, you know how much we hate these in this podcast, the Navy Seals of fascism. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first fascist Navy Seals, unlike the, the yeah. new, uh, just like the new ones. Uh, I was going to say the explicitly fascist Navy Seals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they all met up at fucking Franco's funeral. And so, like, yep. we have this giant nexus of people surrounding this. Yeah, oh, and, it's and, funny because it's like at some point it starts to feel almost Lynchian where it's like these these like locations of different black lodges throughout the world. Do you I know? I was just going to say, it literally it is the Black Lodge. Yeah. A- among the uh, the other, I keep thinking of Norm MacDonald going, all the stars are here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what I'm thinking of, Josef Mengele Exactly, the angel of death himself, Josef Mengele. And, and the other thing too about Mangala too is that there is a town in Brazil which yep. it's been this has been disputed, but I mean this is not disputed. This town has a ten percent twinning population. That means that ten percent of the of the births there are births of twins. For for comparison, in the surrounding areas, in fact the surrounding neighborhoods, the twinning population is one point eight percent. And uh, that is one of the places Joseph Mengele was allegedly called home after World War II. Of course, yeah. famous for his experiments on twins in 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 the camps. Yeah, his fascination with them in general. And I believe didn't didn't Scorzani go to uh, Colonia Dignidad at one point or another? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's uh, it, I would be surprised if he hadn't. I mean, this the, the way Colonia Dignidad worked is that if you were a Nazi and you were visiting um, Chile. You would go there and stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like there, yeah, there's I without a doubt. I read a CIA cable earlier about uh, it was actually in the, from the '80s when they were looking for for um, for Mengele, even though he'd been dead for about four years. I'm sure whoever wrote this report just wasn't included on the fact that the CIA definitely knew that. But this is about Miguel Serrano. This is a CIA cable. Serrano was in contact with Von Sanger, who was uh, I looked him up earlier. Hard to find information of him on him, but was a part of Vlasov's volunteer army sort of the turncoat russians that the germans yeah, made into their yeah. own pet russian army who never actually were able to fight i believe they had basically like one small battle and then all surrendered uh according to to uh further confidential information serrano was in contact with von sanger uh in connection with the purchase of a real estate in chile which was meant to be a rest home for right extremists uh, yes. It later goes on to say uh, about Colonia Dignidad, how they all visit there and hang out there. So, yeah. And I know some members of uh, the thing we alluded to before, Le Cercle, which is basically a, a not a group in itself so much as kind of a combination, a meta group of a bunch of other groups of various European reactionary Catholic organizations. Somebody once said it's the Catholic version of the Bilderberg group, hmm. which seems about right. And um, there was a guy... Um, we mentioned Agente Press before, and Agente Press was this bizarre setup uh, that posed as a press organization like the AP or Reuters, that kind of thing, but was actually essentially a fascist mercenary army. Yes. And the guy who ran it, um, no one knows what his real name was, but he was known variously as uh, Yves Gaillou and Yves Guerin Serac. Uh, and I've heard him called Gayou more frequently. I'm pretty sure Yves Gayou was at Colonia Dignidad as well. Mm. Yeah, so I think the thing is about Dignidad and that, you know, it's so important that, you know, at this moment as we're kind of moving through this history is that it is this nexus point. And then um, as you were kind of saying earlier about this sort of like detachment, you know, how these these uh, organizations or organs institutions detached from their like original purpose uh that also happens with dignidad and it becomes an Mm -hmm. essential essential institution um in not just the you know um the the coup against allende but also in the complete like the legitimation and uh continued like rule dictatorship uh pinochet and it becomes like a, a kind of essential um you know it basically a, a death and torture camp for pinochet and any kind of chilean dissidents yes and, and a key point in the expansion of 
particular Latin American dictatorships. Yes. Like like Pinochet in Chile or Jorge Horacio Videla in, in Argentina to the continent-wide Operation Condor. That right. It yes. essentially consolidates all of them via the CIA into one body. Yeah, yeah. so when we talk about, you know, we're going to have to go into a part two about this because we're already running long. So this is probably a good... Um, a good stopping point just to say that like we're sort of detailing, you know, I know this has been kind of a wide ranging conversation and it, and it touches all these different kind of crazy histories, but you know, that it's, it's, it's such an insane case because you've got this, you know, the dispersion of the Nazis and post, uh, you know, post-war into South America, you know, this, this sort of colony, this bizarro, um, you know, fucking molestation farm for this one Nazi freak becomes an essential nexus point for what will reshape the entire, uh, you know, South American continent over the over the twentieth century or the rest of the twentieth century. And and what I guess what we're trying to suggest, as to bring it back to what we talked about to start the episode, is that this is not a coincidence, that there is a thorough line from these developments of post-war and what happens with the Nazis and how they get re-assimilated into the fabric of global governance and what we witness through, you know, with American and global corporate involvement, of course, in the overthrow of, you know, social democratic, in the case of Allende, um, you know, uh, governments for, for um, proving ground purposes of neoliberal revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. This, this is all uh, tactically designed to enable both the, you know, first world takeover of the third world, basically what I would call the third world war. Yes. I think the Third World yeah, War has already absolutely. happened. Yeah, and yeah, that was it, and uh, also to uh, enable the violent turn away from any kind of socialism or even mild social democracy, yeah, and toward what we would call neoliberalism. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is literally my favorite subject to talk <laughs> about. I know. I can't wait to do part two. I'm already like, fuck, we have so much to get into. Yes. So the thing is about part two is if you thought this first part was weird and dark and fucked up, everything gets 10 times worse. And we get to see, decade. we get to see uh, an appearance from friend of the pod, uh, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger is going to show oh, up. Oh yeah. yeah. Kissinger has actually been involved in like several events that I've named so far. But I know, gets, I know, but he, he gets, gets real, he gets, gets real hands. closely involved in this. Yeah. He gets in real deep. <laughs> Before we finally go, you want to hear my Kissinger? Yes. Yeah. I think we inherited the tragedy <laughs> and I... And I think we extricated ourselves with honor from this tragedy. <laughs> How is that man still alive? Uh, he can't die. This will yeah. do it. This will do it. He's physically incapable of dying. This will do it. I've been <laughs> battling Miguel Serrano on the astral plane and Kissinger on the, uh, <laughs> on the corporeal He's, realm. You, you know that Greek myth where the Cumian Sybil wishes for eternal life, but she forgets, she forgets to wish for eternal youth, so she just like rots and decomposes, but she's still alive? It looks like Kissinger is doing that. Like he's he's actually been dead for like twenty five years. Wait, I actually have a theory on that. That we got to get. All right, remind me of that when we start part two because I <laughs> okay. I have something on that. We can connect yeah. that. That is that is perhaps a Rathenau esque. <laughs> okay. Uh, endeavor. Okay. All right, Michael, get the fuck out of here. Let's talk. Uh, <laughs> let's talk soon. I really would love to do part two of this as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Probably be like a week or something. Yeah, th whenever, whenever you're ready. Thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. Thank you. Absolutely. I feel bad that we had to kind of like cut that short, but man, we're already at like an hour 30 yeah, or whatever. Yeah, that's okay. I want to do two parts anyways. I should have thought Oh, I was before, going but... with the outro. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Sorry. Uh, well, let's just keep going, baby. I thought we were just talking.
Um, I didn't know I was I being do recorded. like just talking to you. By the way, by the Did way, you know California this conversation is, is being recorded, Bruce? I was going to say, California is a two-party recording state, which I know, which I know, because when I try to be a private investigator, turns out that you can't just record people and then sell the footage to their husband or wife or whatever to prove that they're not cheating, even though they hadn't hired you and that they just live together and have a happy marriage. Turns out you can't do that. And I got a lot of trouble for it. So you don't want that to happen to you, baby. Oh God. (laughs) Well, we're recording. We're recording. Okay. Did I, I'm supposed to tell you that. So now you've been notified. So you can't, you can't say shit, man. I got to notify you of something. What? I'm not going to know. Because you were rude to me. <laughs> oh. But it's pretty, it's pretty, here, I'll message it to, I'll message it to him. Not to no. you, to him. No. <laughs> this is stupid. Okay. All right, let's get out of here. My name is Brace. I'm Liz. We are, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.